Today we're talking stories, how they connect us, how they make us curious, and how they make us the kind of people that we're trying to be. If you wonder if you have a story to share, you might want to listen to today's episode. We have Corinne Lay, the producer and host of the podcast, This is the Gospel. Join us today on Go and Be. Hello and welcome to Go and Be. I'm your host, Christy Gardner, and I'm joined by Michelle McCullough. And it has long been a hope of mine to have our guest that we have today come and share her message with us. Today we have Corinne Lay, who is the producer and host of the storytelling podcast, This is the Gospel. Yay, Corinne, I'm so excited that no, you're here. it's so fun to be with you guys. Well, and I love that we're turning the tables just a little bit on you because <laughs> we want to talk about your story and we want to talk about stories in general and what you've learned through your process of interviewing so many people and hearing about their stories. But I would love for you to just share, like, what is a story from your life, your youth, your mm. growing up that you think about that you know was an anchor point that has kind of helped you? with where you are today. Oh my gosh, that is an impossible question I to know, answer. I know, I totally just sprung it on you. I didn't even tell you. Because the truth is everything is a story if you look back at it, right? So I feel like I could, I could be, we could be here for days. We could, we mm. could. Let's think about that. Um, so the question was, which, which like, think like, of a, a story, a like a story that is integral to my faith or just my life? Yes, or anything. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. Oh, well, I think, I think the first time that I realized that, that all of our lives are story filled and I've, t I've mentioned this story before on the podcast. So if anybody is listening, I'm really sorry. You have to hear this again. But when I was 29, I had an internet boyfriend. Have That's you heard so this before? Romantic. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It was back before the the this thing that the kids do the these swiping. days, the, the swiping, swiping. Yeah. and it was um, LDS singles, so dot com. It was yeah. a dot com. Oh, yeah. And I was 29, and I met this man in Australia, and just fell head over heels in love, and we saved up all our money. I had a bring your own boyfriend, bring your own internet boyfriend, um, benefit concerts. <laughs> around Salt Lake and Oregon to raise the money so that I could go meet my internet boyfriend. Because you're a musician. As I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. a musician as well. And so I was like playing love songs and people were donating money and he oh. had sold a car so that we could buy the ticket because Australia is not cheap. Did I mention he was from Australia? You yeah. did. Did yeah. I? Um, he had a great accent. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and so besides all the concerns that like I was going to go there and get murdered and live like be in a basement somewhere, it was just the most exciting time of my life. Just I was in love and I was excited to go and I flew to Australia. We saved up the money and I went and I had three amazing weeks in Adelaide, Australia. It was mm. beautiful. I mm. loved it. I had never been outside the United States. And so I had to get a passport for the first time. And, and I had to get on a plane by myself for the first time, not the first time, but I had to get on a plane by myself out of the country. And I got there and it was amazing. And he broke up with me on my 29th birthday oh. on the beach in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I came home devastated, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. that's tragic. I just was like, oh, I'm an old Mormon woman who's, you know, never going to get married. And I was messaging a friend of mine after it all happened. And I was like, oh, this is so tragic. It's so terrible. It's so awful. And she wrote back to me. Her name is Lumina, which is the best name for a that human being. That really is the best Isn't name. that the best name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her name is Lumina. And she said, you did it. You lived the movie. You went to Australia to find true love and you broke up on a beach on your birthday. <laughs> you lived an adventure. And, um, and ever since then, that's always in the back of my mind, this idea that, that we're here to live the movie. We're here to, to live the adventure. And obviously not everyone has to fly <laughs> to Australia, you know, with a, to meet an internet boyfriend, but but I do think that there is something really beautiful and valuable about looking at your life from that lens 
of what am I learning? What is the purpose of this experience? It's, it's that growth mindset that comes from being a storyteller, from living in, in that space of storytelling. Mm. So. so through the experience of telling storytelling and hearing other people tell their stories and sitting with them, mm -hmm. I've been a guest on your podcast mm -hmm. and I've been there as I'm trying to share a story and it is not comfortable to share stories sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And you, sit with people and you guide them on seeing their lives as a story worth telling. Mm. What has that experience been like for you? What have you learned? Oh, I honestly, like I'm gonna start crying because it's such a sacred honor to be with people. I, I feel like I'm a story midwife on some level. That mm. is awesome, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've realized it's labor. It's to, some people are natural storytellers, so they come to the table with it sort of mapped out in their head, or they have a sense of where the story is going to go or how to, how, to, how to build it so that it's going to be the most interesting. Um, and other people, they know they have something to share, but they're not exactly sure how to, how to put it together. And so we actually call that story developing. Like, it, I don't consider it an interview. Yeah. Um, and it, it really does feel like, like a labor, a birthing process of, of seeing somebody and asking them the right questions so that they can find their own story. And that's why you don't hear me or any of the story producers in the final storytelling. And we're a little different than most podcasts because a lot of podcasts, it's um, you know, an interview and then an answer, an interview question and then an answer. And ours is just the person telling their story. And so our process, like you experienced, Christy, was to, to find the beginning, find the middle, and then find that point of transformation. Mm -hmm. And it isn't easy for some people to find that. Or you think you know how to do it until you get in front of and a microphone don't. and then it's like. <laughs> so um, that is a sacred experience for me. It's really powerful for me to help, um, to help people find the touch points in their own life that have created transformation for them, especially when it comes to the gospel. And what yeah. happens to people when they realize that their story is worth telling, that their story has touch points, that their story has testimony in it? Have mm. you seen them change? Well, what's really interesting is that most people, I, I, I almost say this as a, like a rule, you're going to feel like what you just gave me as we recorded is not good. Like they're going to leave after the recording mm -hmm. and second guess themselves and doubt it. And, and I feel like the gift of editing <laughs> is that we can help, we try to make sure that in the editing that we're authentic, that we gather what's authentic about your story because right. we definitely don't want to tell your story in a way that doesn't matter. But I've had people come back after we've edited and added the music and, and they just are like, I don't remember saying that. I don't remember that that's how, that's what I said. And that's really cool for me too that I'm like, no, you said all of those things. Those were all the things that you felt and thought, and we just kind of put them into an order. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that is a really beautiful thing for people to hear themselves elevated like that, to hear that their story has, like you said, that their story has this sort of granular beauty to it that they might not be able to see or understand until it is in their face. And other people are, are experiencing emotional having some emotional experience with it. Well, and one of the blessings of listening to the podcast as I have listened, I love the show, um, is that it makes me feel like everyone's story matters, that everyone has a story to share, that everyone has something that can change my life. Mm -hmm. And it changes the way that I look at my sisters and brothers when I'm at church or when I'm at the grocery store. I look at them and I think that person has a story that could change my life if I would yeah. take the time to yeah. listen to it. Well, one of our tag, I have, <laughs> there are a couple things that I say. I always joke that um, this is the gospel is the best parts of testimony meeting without the worst parts of testimony <laughs> meeting because it's, you know, it's the storytelling. It's the stuff that our brains are wired to hear those stories and to remember them and to synthesize them into our ourselves. Like that's just, that's part of how we work as human beings. But, um, but the other thing that we always say is that your story has power. And I think that when you recognize that you have a story and then you recognize that your story has a power, as daughters and sons of God, we have a covenant obligation to 
I, I love it best. Sister Reina Berto um, did an interview with Yehosh Bonner that, that uh, a little while ago, and she talked about storytelling and her life story. And the thing that blew me away is that we asked her the question, is it ever hard for you to tell your story? Because she has a lot of really tragic things that have mm -hmm. happened to her. And she said, you know, it is hard for me, but somewhere along the line, I realized it wasn't my story. That all of our stories belong to to our heavenly Father, and and He is the one that has has given us this life, and so our stories, in some sense, belong to Him. And if we can use our stories to bless the lives of others, to develop faith, to move people closer to Christ, there's power there, and we are covenantly obligated, um, when it's the right time for us, to share those stories so that we can bless and help each other. And I think it's really cool to see people recognize the power of that yeah. in themselves. Yeah. And I think we'll have better, better sacrament meetings if people recognize that their <laughs> stories are powerful and yeah. that people want to hear them. And I love the way that you shared that because it makes me think about agency and how we don't always have agency in the things that happen to us. We don't always get to decide mm -hmm. what happens in our lives, but we do get to decide what we do with what happens. Mm -hmm. And using our stories to help other people allows us to become part of healing and part of love and part of light, even if the stories and the hard things that have happened to us aren't love, light, yeah. sunshine, and lollipops. Well, and I'd also add that there is a time and a place to share our stories, right? One of my favorite Brene Brown moments, Auntie you, Brene. Auntie Brene, Auntie I was Brene. gonna say, that's what you call um, her. One of my favorite things that she ever said was, if, you're, if you are, um, if the story that you tell still has so much weight for you that, it, that, that when, if somebody were to reject it, you would feel um, hurt by that, then it's not time to tell that story yet. Because vulnerability is a practice and telling stories requires vulnerability, especially personal yeah. stories. So, so I think that it's really important for people to recognize that your story does have power, but it's also okay if now isn't the time to tell it. Yes. Um, and I think that the spirit can guide us about, we, we have that sometimes where people will come to us and they'll say, I have this story to tell. And it's really clear like a few minutes in, that it's not time yet, mm -hmm. that the story's still, and, and again, that goes back to that birthing mm -hmm. metaphor, right? Yeah. Like there's it a time and a place that it has, it hasn't gestated, it hasn't gotten to the place where they're gonna feel personal pain, that where they won't feel personal pain if they share it and somebody rejects it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's an important thing for people to also, think Also, when she says, we share our stories with the people who've earned the right to hear yes, them. Yes, exactly. And we have to make sure that our sacred stories, our sacred moments are shared in an appropriate way yeah. with people who have hearts to receive them. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. What would you say to the woman who's watching this who feels like they have no story? And maybe as a byproduct, doesn't feel like has a testimony or that their testimony isn't deep enough or mm -hmm. that what their experiences have happened in their life haven't mattered enough to be a story. Yeah. I think one of the things I love the most about This is the Gospel is that it shows um, it, the, the stories aren't huge. Like every once in a while we'll have a story where it's like, I climbed Kilimanjaro and I was on a boat that almost sunk. You know, occasionally we get those really dramatic stories, but most of the time the stories that, that we help people to tell are those quiet moments when they knew God was present in their life. And I think that um, when you start listening to other people's stories and you start, start kind of surrounding yourself in that space, you'll start to feel the stories of your own life come, come up, right? And, and you'll realize that quiet and small stories are as valuable in your personal history as the big sweeping, romantic, go to Australia, you know, get broken up with on a beach stories. Um, and sometimes those are more powerful because they're yours. And so um, my advice to somebody who's like sitting around thinking, oh, that's nice for you, you don't, I, but you don't know, I've, I've lived a quiet life, is to immerse yourself in story so that you can start thinking like that so that your brain and your spirit and your heart can be opened up to the idea that you do have a story and then um and then spend some time writing in a journal even if you're not you don't think you're a good writer if you start in that space you'll start to find your story 
Um, and then the other thing that I would say is ask someone else. Mm -hmm. Ask someone else to tell you what they see. You know, what, where, where have you seen, um, where have you seen my faith affect somebody? Oh, that's a dumb thing to say. No, I was to be. I was like, I was like, like <laughs> okay, ask some, okay. So ask somebody else what they see in you and what what stories, where your stories have intersected. And and I think that I think that we can get a lot from having those conversations with each other. Um, it's hard. I'd also say go to therapy. Talk to a therapist. <laughs> like if you think your life is small, all it will take is a couple of talk sessions for you to realize that your depth and your humanity and the the hard things that you're experiencing that you think no one else is is having that those things are those things are beautiful and that's that, that your story is there. I don't know. That's a really <laughs> great idea. I think everybody should go to therapy. I'm not <laughs> sure if I had a Saturday's warrior moment with my husband in the pre-existence, but I am sure that I did with a therapist. I'm sure. I, I love my therapist. I'm sure that in the pre-existence, I was like, you're going to help me. Yeah. yeah. Because I think, I think honestly, like that idea of being introspective, I, I learned that in therapy. I learned how to be thoughtful about myself and to like find what's what's ticking in there and why and then the stories come right because then you have you can get to the depth of like why what the motivation was and why why i did that i don't know i think it, it offers me an opportunity to be more curious about myself i love that you know what i'm so excited about what i'm so excited about thinking about how story makes us curious about other people mm -hmm. and i am thinking about a time i sat around a campfire with you yes, oh. and with people I didn't know very well. And we all sat around a campfire. And what was the question you asked us? Oh, well, we were doing a kind of exercise where each person had to tell a personal story based yeah. on a word. And then um, they had to, then the next person had to, had to listen to that story and find their own story kind of connected to that. It was really fun. It was so powerful. Yeah. Because you're sitting around this campfire with people you don't know, and you're thinking about their stories, and then you're thinking about your stories. And what I loved about the exercise is that it connected mm. all of the stories together into one whole. Yeah. And what it allowed me to do was to get curious about other people's stories yeah. and to start to see how I am more the same than I am different. What do you think about curiosity and story? Oh, if this is this is kind of my, if I had a platform, this yes. would be the one that I would stand upon. I just think, I think that um, curiosity is is a virtue that that if we embrace it, it is one of it is one of the the gospel principles that I I don't think we ever talk about it as a gospel principle, but I think that you cannot. You cannot have this gospel. You cannot have um, learning without curiosity. And when I think about Joseph Smith, right, his whole thing was he was curious. He went into a, a grove of trees and he asked, hey, is everything that I've been seeing here, is that, is that real and is that right? And, and when I think about how we interact with one another, if we can harness that same sort of curiosity of constantly asking ourselves, is what I see here what's really going on? And especially when it comes to other people. And if we ask ourselves, I, what, what would their story be? And obviously not make up a story for them, but, but ask yourself, what could their story be? I think we're gonna have so much more grace for one another. Mm -hmm. And so much more mercy when when we offer our curiosity to one another as a gift. And I think we're seeing right now in the world the danger of not being curious about mm -hmm. people. And yeah. wh what have you experienced that happens when you lack curiosity in interactions with others? I mean, I think we're seeing the danger <laughs> all around us right now, right? The assumptions, the, the sort of... Um, creating of other like we make people that if, if we don't have curiosity for one another it's really easy to to separate ourselves but the truth is that we are all deeply connected to one another and and when we offer when we offer curiosity um it, can i just say it's not easy it's mm -hmm. not easy to mm -hmm. be curious it's really hard hard work <laughs> 
to be curious about the motives of people who are hurting you or who are um, not not their best selves at any given moment. Like I literally feel like every time someone posts a meme on Facebook that is divisive, I, I'm not always good at not jumping to conclusions or saying, ah, yeah, block, you know? I mean, that would be an initial reaction is, and there's there's good things about setting boundaries, but, um, but when we can offer curiosity to that, then I think it, it gives us more opportunities to develop our Christ-like love charity, the thing that we're all after, the thing that we're here to sort of harness. Um, I think you have to have curiosity and without that, it's really hard to have charity. I just love the way you're describing how curiosity and story intermingle mm -hmm. to make it okay to be on this earth with people that don't think in the exact same way that we do. It's not always easy, right? No, I think mm -hmm. that um, it's interesting to have some of these conversations and to think back. I had a dad who was the weird uncle, you know, <laughs> but he was my dad, you know. Yeah. But then we went to, to family gatherings and he was always the one that's like, what's the meaning? <laughs> oh my they, gosh, I think I'm the weird uncle. I'm the weird uncle, <laughs> the weird uncle in my family. <laughs> but uh, but as I look back on that, I and they sometimes some of them embraced the question and loved it, and others were, would kind of be scared because they were put on the spot. But ultimately, I, I, what a gift that was of him, like caring about them, and he he wanted to know what their meaning of life was, and they'd be like, yeah. I don't know what the answer. He's like, No, what's it to you? Mm -hmm. But what a gift that was to ask somebody and to give them the opportunity to share their own piece instead of him sitting down saying, hey, let me tell you about blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and that, that also loving that he was weird and that <laughs> he had his own story, right? And yeah. there was a curiosity about him that they could choose to either embrace or block, right? Yeah. So I think our lives, like you said, as they are more intersected than they are separate, um, I think the adversary would have us to be a me versus you or an us versus them. And any chance mm -hmm. he can get us to put people into boxes or buckets um, and divide the believers, mm -hmm. then he wins this war. Yeah. And stories and curiosity and seeking to find ways that we can appreciate each other, even if we don't agree, yeah. is probably some magic that brings good things. Yeah. Well, and you brought up a really interesting point about um, when you said your dad would sit there and he'd make space for people to to say their truth, right? Like he would open that up and he'd say, I actually want to hear what you have to say. And I think that the the other side of curiosity, it's it's interesting to be a person who's interested, but it's, it's the second half of that is that you have to be an active listener. Mm -hmm. And so Christy, when you were talking about what is it like to help people tell their stories, mm -hmm. the thing that, that I think all the time is I'm just a really good listener. Like I am, I am listening to what you're saying without thinking about what comes next or how I'm going to interact with that, you know? And I, and I let the spirit be the one to say, oh, right here, ask a question instead of me always thinking okay well, well how do i get the next thing out of them how do i get how do i how do i rebut that point how do i how do i move past that or help them see my way of thinking to be curious means that you also have to be really good at stepping back and saying i'm making space for whatever you're about to tell me mm. Even if that thing that you tell me challenges something that i hold dear even if that thing that you tell me hurts me a little bit, I am making room for that and I'm not gonna say anything until you've had your opportunity to speak. Yeah. And so being a storyteller is has to be, being a curious storyteller has to go hand in hand with being a curious listener. Um, and, and I think that, that we don't make as much space for listening as we should. That's a very mm -hmm. important point, one yeah. that I can definitely improve in my life. And I want to we acknowledge what a gift it is that you have to mm -hmm. be able to do that. You're very kind. I've been blessed by it. <laughs> so we're coming to the end of the time. Yes. And I'm very sad because we could talk to Corinne forever. <laughs> <laughs> but we ask all of our guests one question, yes. and that is if you could give our listeners and viewers one piece of advice on how to go into the world and be, what would you say? Hmm. I would say stay soft hmm. because experience and stories are, um, all of the things that we experience 
are meant to teach us something, right? And it's really easy to put up walls when you, when you start to realize that there's a lot of hard things that happen to each of us. There are a lot of hard things that happen. But if you can find a way to offer yourself softness and to, to move in the world as though it's not your enemy, you're gonna find a lot of joy and you'll have more stories to tell because you'll be open to those stories. So if you, if, if you feel like there's nothing, nothing in your life that is offering you the kind, of, um, the kind of stories that you wish you were having, then the next step is to figure out how to be soft, how to keep yourself open to experience and opportunity. And, um, and I feel like that's like the opposite of what <laughs> the world would teach us, right? Thick and, skin. Yeah, have, yeah, and boundaries don't mean, having boundaries doesn't mean hardness. I think you can have boundaries and stay soft. And that is, that's something that I, um, that I believe in. I believe in that. And I think that Jesus Christ wants us to remain wholehearted and soft. Mm. So I, that's, that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne, for being here. And thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation today as we share some stories and know that you have yours to share too. Go into the world and be soft. Go and be curious. Go and be one who tells and discovers your own stories. Go and be. Sweet salt. Sweet salt modest clothing at Seagull Books.